All right, very good morning. Thursday, 21st of June. Hope you were well. I'm going to go through some of the main news items of the morning uh, and then a look ahead for the trading day. Uh, Bank of England interest rate announcement coming up. Going to look at that in more detail, what the market's going to be looking for for its cue for potential market reaction. Um, this being then the kind of belief about a potential for setting up the scene for a, a rate hike, not today, but for later on in the year. Uh, and we'll look at the, the how the economy lies at the moment and then what exactly the release is going to entail. But in terms of the charts this morning, I mean, one thing is that, you know, if you look at where we were just, what, two days ago when the market was seeing a se severe bout of short-term kind of negative sentiment, that obviously recovered yesterday. Uh, and equity markets are kind of steadied following the more, I guess, diplomatic at least commentary of which we were hearing from China, which has kind of meant that this tip for tap escalation that looked like it was developing has kind of just come off the boil slightly. Um, in terms of US equities, here's a stat for you. Um, when the S&P 500, uh, today being the first day of summer, when the S&P 500 is up over 3% year to date heading to the first day of summer, like this year, the full year has been positive every single time since 1950. So, you know, it's been, if you were looking for a statistical pattern, uh, then certainly it's been set up for another year of potential upside. However, obviously these stats do need to be taken in context, but I just thought quite an interesting thing for, for the morning. Uh, but just looking at some of the major um, currencies and other assets to see what the kind of risk uh, tone is this morning. And equities are uh, relatively flat in the US futures, although a little bit of negative performance has been evident in the European space, particularly that of the German DAX. It's not by any means um, a huge move, but we are trading negative. And as I talk here, the DAX just touching on a fresh uh, session low. Some news has come out, and you'll know that as a collective of companies, the automotive sector um, of the German DAX index uh, is one of the highest proportions um, of what comprises on the breakdown. And actually, you've had some coverage this morning where Daimler has become the first to predict a profit hit on the ongoing trade war. So Daimler has cut its profit outlook due to escalating trade tensions between the US and China, claiming Chinese customers will now buy fewer cars after Beijing has slapped tariffs on US auto imports. Um, so what they did was uh, late yesterday, its full year earnings excluded some items will be slightly lower than last year. And so them being the first to really explicitly comment on the impact of this trade war situation in its in reality uh, onto their profitability has had a knock-on effect to people like Volkswagen, BMW, so on and so forth. So if looking at the DAX and its constituents on the losers this morning, you can see down here, uh, hopefully you'll be able to see that in the bottom right-hand corner, um, but you got the top three losers, Daimler down over three, BMW down about two and a half, Volkswagen down 2% as well. So uh, potentially a little bit of underperformance there um, in the German car making sector that has weighed slightly on the index. But overall, the future is not seeing a dramatic sell off um, as you know, looking at the other uh, assets, things are relatively calm, at least for the time being. Gold then lower. Um, this morning, dollar touch firmer. So both major pairs um, have seen some uh, have seen a drift lower. Um, saw a couple of you in the pound trade this morning on the break of the um, the initial low that we printed in yesterday's session, and then uh, subsequently the S1 level. However, the price has come back to that initial low from uh, yesterday morning. Euro has held the range thus far in the futures, at least. Um, and actually, if you start looking at this this chart, I guess, taking into account the really big move that we saw on the back of the dovish ECB, we have gone into a fairly tight, about a 75 pip range over the course of the last kind of two days or so. Uh, so and that has held thus far on that kind of third, fourth test this morning. Uh, 
Uh, so worth just keeping an eye on that uh, as we progress through the through the session today. Uh, but talking of the pound, there's obviously been an update for Theresa May. We saw this really develop yesterday, so not really too much new to add. Just a lot of the headlines talking about uh, Theresa May surviving to fight another day on Brexit, but at what cost? Uh, I.e., you know, it's kind of death by a thousand cuts. It seems she's still going, uh, but you know, this this kind of pro-Remain sentiment amongst some of these so-called rebels. You know, how much has that now weakened her, or if anything, has that you know just further fueled the argument of the Brexiteers, who for months have been trying to force the Prime Minister? Uh, to kind of confront those in her party that want to soften or delay the departure from the EU. Um, you know, they've argued that the Remainers don't have the votes, even with the opposition Labour Party, to defeat her. And some people, some of the Brexiteers, kind of looking at Dominique Grieve, who brought forward this kind of issue, if you like, about the meaningful vote as what a waste of time because he backed down at the end. But uh, as you saw with markets yesterday, the response wasn't particularly huge because after the, the kind of ping pong, which is actually the official term for what it is, when it bounces back between the lower and upper house of parliament, you know, it gets to the, I think it's the third reading. And then at that point, obviously, the concession gets made and the government won out, which was as expected. People make their political stand and get their point across. But at the last um, chance, they then all agree and we move on. Uh, the point being then that the Remainers, if anything, have achieved at least a bit of disruption to Theresa May um, and the party's confidence in her. Looking at the pound at the moment, though, we did break lower, as I said earlier this morning. Where do we go from here? It starts to, you know, you have to really broaden out the chart because, you know, we're trading at levels really we haven't traded at since going all the way back to November of last year. So we're talking about eight month lows at the moment in cable. Um, looking at the price points here, you've got, I guess, looking at the, the levels, kind of initial highs that we had around July of last year is quite close proximity to where we are. But the bigger, kind of more solid technical point uh, on the downside, if we're looking more, more long term, uh, that 130.53 uh, is a really key level. Uh, if we remain, con you know, continuation of this trend lower that we've seen materialise ever since the peak that was seen in April, uh, this kind of area here and here, that would be a, a level of great interest. Um, whether or not we can get down there, today's Bank of England could certainly be um, quite a deciding factor. Not that I think that the market's going to drop 150 today. Obviously, it's a possibility it could. I think unlikely to do so, though. But one of the main things is we've got the Bank of England and the market's severe repricing that it's gone through um, in regards to the belief of when a hike is going to happen. Uh, a hike is going to happen. It's just a matter of when. The sooner, the more kind of uh, bullish that would be for the pound, the more they delay it, the more negative. Now, just having a look. Yeah, that's it. Piers is uh, giving me the... The funny look but yeah I'm just going off what the central bank are telling us they're gonna lift rates it's a matter of when um, but looking at the I've got some charts here for the Bank of England that could be something here to have a look at then as we prep up for this event and what to expect from today now, there's a couple of charts and graphics here so how this is going to work is at midday so noon we're going to get the immediate release now, one of the things unique to this one is that this isn't a quarterly inflation report release. There is no press conference. So what you're going to get is the announcement, i.e. rates unchanged in a incredibly unlikely hike 25. Uh, but then you also get the accompanying vote split and then uh, the, the minutes as well, which come out with every announcement. And so there's kind of three things you're looking at here. Now, no one's really expecting rates to change. So if, you're gonna, if you were going to break through the noise, you could pretty much eradicate the actual rate decision. They're not going to hike today. That's not what the market's looking for. Then it moves to then the vote split. So what are we looking for from the vote split? And as you can see here from a Bloomberg poll of 38 analysts across a variety of different banks, they're looking at a vote split of 7-2. Now, 7-2 is unsurprising. 
because as you all know, if you track the NPC kind of composition, uh, Michael Saunders and Ian McCafferty are incredibly hawkish. Um, they have continued to vote against the pack more often or not over the last kind of 18 months. And this is absolutely unsurprising. So you got a 7-2. That being said, if you were to get something like a 9-0 to hold, that means that would be very dovish. And actually, in the kind of sequence of how the market typically reacts to this type of event, given the rate decision itself is such a non-event on the rate specific, the vote split could be the knee-jerk initial first reaction. A 9-0, I'd be expecting the pound to pop lower on the back of that. Whether or not that move is sustained is then really where the balance of how this whole event's going to play out will come, which is the minutes. The commentary on the bottom line, whether or not the Bank of England are going to signal their intent to lift rates in August, which is the kind of the most nearest term potential date of which they could action that, given that August is a quarter of the inflation report month, uh, and markets are priced, last time I looked, at about 40%. So it has dropped. It was a little bit more like 50-50 only a few weeks ago. It's dropped a little bit, but it's not going to take a lot for that to rise back up and for August to come back on the table. If they hold today, you get a 7-2 split, and then the actual um, minutes reflect the fact that economic conditions, if continue, and if things continue to improve, then they could lift rates in August. That could be the signal. Now, some of the things to have a look at from an economic perspective the services sector, obviously such a pivotal component of economic growth in our country. Um, and that did come out higher than forecast in the service PMI um, for the previous reading that we had. You can see here, um, we did have a bit of a dip in the prior month, but much like uh, with this data, people are, are putting that purely down to the weather and the beast from the east and the impact that that had uh, as a read across and since then we have bounced back on the retail sales front I think this is a little bit of a false dawn on the retail sales number because if you remember you've got this big spike up here in the last reading because we had such, such an exceptionally hot May and we also you, know, you throw in a royal wedding and obviously things like alcohol sales as well as lots of other um, service sector based goods restaurants, dining, things like that, um, all pick up due to these, these kind of exceptional circumstances. The other thing as well, retail sales could be skewed as a data set for next month's reading as well, because of course we're in the midst of the World Cup at the moment. And, uh, and arguably there has been data over previous major football tournaments, the Euros and the World Cup, where the further that, that England can progress, the more this can translate then into obviously large increases in in sales of alcoholic beverages of which we know that the the brits don't mind partaking in uh, certainly if we cut the mustard and make it through uh, the latter rounds of the tournament the other thing of course that's happening is the paychecks uh, wage growth actually tailed off a little bit uh, in april but the important thing here is we still have a uh, real wage growth that period of negative real wage growth, which was evident really through much of 2017, that was obviously uh, flipped back into what would be a more positive situation for the UK consumer. However, um, wage growth, which looked pretty solid on an upward trend for a fairly persistent period of about 12 months, looks to have peaked at around the point it peaked a few years ago, uh, this going back to 2015. If that starts to converge, this is obviously going to restrict the more hawkish members of the Bank of England. Uh, here it is. Here's the, the August rate hike calls and how things have changed. Uh, and if you remember, in May, we saw a dramatic fall off ahead of that meeting of a real economic slowdown. You remember, GDP at the time was decreasing faster than expected. I think we got the lowest growth rate now in the UK since Q2 of 2012. Inflation has dropped quickly as well. And so these were the arguments then to discount a May hike. And we went from about 90% about two weeks before the event to absolutely nothing. So things can change incredibly quickly. I'd say of all the central banks, 
possibly the UK could be the most receptive to incoming economic data uh, to judge um, what's going on. Uh, and this obviously has the, the other big elephant in the room, which is Brexit and how that starts to materialise as the negotiation progresses, whether or not this creates, as time goes on, further delays, more uncertainty, which could translate, I guess, into uh, near-term negativity uh, in that sense. So, yeah, quite a few things to, to contemplate. One other quick thing that I just wanted to show you was here. On the right-hand side here, you can see the economic data uh, has been mixed since the May meeting. So what, what ING have done here is on the left-hand side on the table, you've got the green, which is data which would suggest a hawkish outcome, i.e. things like retail sales, for example, were higher than expected, so it's in green. Things which were weaker were in red and a neutral outcome in the grey. Um, so you can see it's been a little bit mixed, but when you think about what some of the key economic indicators are, that these Western central banks monitor. Wages, inflation, they're the two metrics specifically in the UK and throw in trade balance industrial production that have been weakening and would support the doves and to delay a rate hike. And so, you know, this is what's probably going to lend its hand to if I think if I was the central bank, you'd be playing the card of or well, let's wait and see how things develop keeping options open on the table and so ultimately I might try to deliver a more balanced communi communication in the minutes and the, 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 the discussions and so that you keep August alive without committing in that sense. If you could achieve that creating uh, as minimal as volatility as possible then I think they've probably done their job well uh, in this instance. Coming up then beyond this meeting um, this is what's quite key because you start plotting it out and they've got in here the orange which is kind of some of the uh, the main things that are happening but certainly a big thing to, to factor in for Europe of course and Brexit's future is this and I think this is probably after you've had this meaningful vote situation now kind of put to bed yesterday I would say Brexit news specifically might start to just drop off for a day or two before then it just picks up again going into the European Council meeting which is happening on the 28th and 29th of this month. If you remember this was supposed to be the meeting where Theresa May was going to go to Brussels speak with the European partners about what great progress we've made on our talks over Brexit. However Obviously, just getting her own house in order has been the main issue, and actual negotiations have been non-existent. Uh, and so I would say you can expect, just going off how this is usually gone, Europe are in quite a decent position now to play a little bit of hardball while May's been under some, some pressure at home, is how they'll probably see that play out. But yeah, you can already access this on the the European Council website. You've already got the full agenda here. So you can see on the 28th, uh, you have it's a two day meeting uh, and the various different sessions and timings that are surrounding that. But we'll go into that much more when the time comes. All right, a few other stories just to wrap things up. Um, yesterday, I did see quite a few people trading oil and that's absolutely fine. No problem with that. However, I would say you've just got to be very cautious uh, again about the timelines of which you're holding your trades given the the headline noise that if you thought yesterday there was a lot of OPEC comments today there's going to be even more and I'll explain why after I've spoken about this article specifically what's interesting and this is how the world at OPEC generally works is that they, the official OPEC meeting at the their headquarters in Vienna happens on Friday. However, there's an oil conference, which is an OPEC seminar, happening the two days before that official oil minister, ministerial meeting. Now, what happens uh, from the journalists I speak to is that there's all kinds of shenanigans that go on in Vienna behind closed doors. One being is that there's lots of kind of backdoor meetings where deals are brokered <coughs> under the table between these various different 
heads of the energy kind of ministries of what they're going to do. Therefore, well before the actual OPEC meeting itself, it's pretty clear what it is that they're going to do at that point. Now, one of the things here is that obviously someone's spoken to Iran because uh, magically they're now on board and Iran has eased off on its threat to block any agreement between OPEC and its allies to raise crude production, obviously in sharp contrast to previous comments. Um, the Iranian minister has said was optimistic about the outcome of the OPEC meeting. <laughs> One of the funniest comments I saw was the Saudi oil minister yesterday, uh, Khalid Al Fali, said when questioned, is there going to be a supply increase? He said, well, of course there is. It's a, it's a no-brainer. And I think that kind of speaks volumes because typically what Saudi wants, Saudi gets. And, and obviously that Russian meeting is going to happen with non-OPEC members on the Saturday. So this has become a bit more of a reality. I'd say if you're pricing in expectations, the goalposts have moved slightly because Iran's the biggest conflict to the deal. If they're on board, then the others tend to fall in line then with the, the bigger powers. Uh, and so just taking a look at oil this morning, uh, as I speak actually, just printing on session lows. So a little bit heavy uh, coming down towards, well, that previous ellipse that I've got there, that was the APIs that we had from Tuesday night. So just be looking down to the range lows that we had from yesterday uh, morning. This was obviously the volatility around the oil data that we had from the DOE yesterday. Um, but as I said, you just got to be careful about committing to oil because it does jump about and just because Iran are on board now that doesn't mean they're going to stay on board <laughs> later today these guys do like to change their mind in order to broker a better deal for themselves quite often um, but if you were going to approach the news in an actionable way remember you've got 14 countries in OPEC kind of put a hierarchy on them from the most to least influential uh, by basically size of production uh, and then you're going to you can probably gauge the reaction that their comments could have much easier looking at the schedule this is the actual again so one of the things that the guys here in in-house you might have noticed one thing I spend a lot of time trying to do and, and I suggest that you guys as traders do the same is that you have an economic calendar we know what that looks like got, we'll look at it in a second with the data and the speakers you know if you really are going to trade these products like you're going to trade oil today you need to go one step further now this OPEC international seminar if I show you the page this is a you know, this is a huge event that happens and so there is a complete breakdown of a media agenda pack of everything by time of when explicitly who and what they are speaking on is taking place throughout the entire day. So if I go through here, you've got basically all the CEOs of the major companies in the morning. You go further after 10 a.m. This is Vienna time. You've got um, the Iraqi oil minister. The big one, though, you've got the Saudi speaking. I think it's a bit later on. So here he is. Al Fali is speaking from 11.40 onwards as a keynote speaker. So, you know, this isn't just about reacting to news. This is about preparing for when specifically could the news come. Now, usually between 10 and 12, it's pretty quiet because that's when all the economic data is gone. But if you look at this schedule, well, this is when this meeting just starts to heat up, when the big hitters start coming out. You've got Saudi, Qatar, Venezuela, Nigeria all speaking throughout the morning, Iraq, Kuwait, that being the second and fourth biggest OPEC producing uh, producers speaking from 10 to 11. You know, this is the secondary layer of information that you need to be armed with if you're going to trade or at least be able to react to some of the commentary uh, in a timely fashion. So I'll post this link into the chat when I'm done, but this is kind of the routine I suggest that you guys try to go through. Okay, looking at the calendar then, just flick over my screen one last time. Um, you've had the Swiss National Bank, the SNB have come out, the rates unchanged as completely to be expected. Um, looking at the morning, it is very quiet actually. I mean, you've got UK public finance data. Um, 
occasionally can move the market, uh, but typically not. But I would be monitoring that for sure if you were just looking at the currencies and the, and the pound. The big one, though, is going to be the market probably more interested just to wait and see for what the Bank of England have to say. Again, for clarity's sake, we're not expecting an interest rate hike. We're not expecting anything. You know, this is not like the ECB. We're not expecting anything around their asset purchase facility or QE program. What is going to be interesting as a first point is going to be in the immediate reaction. The vote split is, is it going to be 7-2, which is the consensus? Um, a 9-0 would be dovish. Anything more like a 6-3 or a 5-4 would obviously be incredibly hawkish uh, if this was obviously to vote to hold still. Uh, and then the minutes, I would say, is where you're going to get um, the main part of what could potentially move the market. Um, later on in the afternoon, your regular weekly jobless claims from the US, fully fed, all coming out at 1.30, alongside some CAD data, wholesale trade, and the Canadian ADP number. Uh, and then that's pretty much it for the data slate. The other data, I'd say, is more lower uh, tiered and by default then has uh, a lesser propensity to move market prices. Quite a few speakers though uh, to also be aware of today. Uh, notably ECB Hawk Jens Weidman uh, is speaking at 10.45 this morning. Uh, you've got a Eurogroup meeting in Brussels. I believe this is to do predominantly with Greece is one of the main topics. Uh, if you do hear of any headlines, and you've got Feds Kashkari, Novotny, uh, and a few other people speaking. One interesting thing, though, to add out of all the speakers today, and which potentially could, um, could result in a fairly tame Bank of England um, announcement, is that tonight is the Mansion House speech. And that typically is quite a platform for the Bank of England governor outside of traditional press conferences um, and Bank of England kind of interest rate decisions is a platform where they have said things before that have then moved the market the following morning. Um, whether or not he'll feel the need to do so yet to be seen, but certainly if any of the guys in the live trading room, you're sticking around in the evening, that's, that's worth staying up for and tuning in uh, at 7 p.m. For that, for that speech. Um, and then for any fixed income traders, you do have quite a lot of debt supply hitting market today coming out of the, the French and Spanish Treasury. You're looking at a high end uh, top of about 13, 14 billion euros worth uh, of mid and long dated debt in, in the case of Spain. So something to also just to be aware of. All right, we're going to leave it at that. I'll talk about Bank of England again in more detail at 10 to midday. Uh, otherwise, I wish you all a good day. Thank you very much.